Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Tuesday night Facebook Live Bible study here at GodspeedMinistry.com. We are so grateful to have you as we're doing this study on the book of Revelation, and we thank you for coming back and joining us. We want you to share this with your friends. We, we really appreciate you being here with us. We also want you to know that you can be a partner in ministry with us by sharing this and telling your friends, as you see here on the screen. I hope our watch party, I haven't seen Brother Greg and Michelle and all of the fine folk out there in Benson, North Carolina are with us tonight. I hope that they are. But we want you to share and tell your friends because the book of Revelation is the only book in scripture that has the blessing of God on those who read it and those who hear it. That's what you're going to be doing tonight. And also, we want to remind you, you are a participant. You're not a spectator. You're in this with us. And we are just so grateful that you have chosen to be here with us tonight. And who is this us that I am speaking of? Well, that would be... Mr. Jerry Blazier from down in Navasota, Texas. Jerry, say good evening to everyone. Good evening, folks. Evening from Texas and, and soggy weather. Soggy weather. We could use a little rain up here in the Carolinas. We've gotten dry. And I do see that Greg Parker and the watch party are all here. We definitely are glad to see them here. Also, the other part of us tonight is our digital ministry coordinator, and that is Mr. Harrison Burnett. Harrison? He's quiet Everybody, today. We are glad you're here. <laughs> we are glad that you are all here with us tonight. Harrison, could I impose on you to lead us in our opening prayer tonight? Please. Yeah, absolutely. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for this time and opportunity that we get to come together and, and to be in community and, uh, and learn about you, Lord, and your character, and who you are, and what it is that you want to reveal to us, uh, to open our hearts, Lord. And we pray that you would do just that this evening, that you would open our hearts to, uh, to be open to what it is that you're trying to speak to us, and, and God, that you would just speak through all of us this evening, um, and so that we may be able to deliver your message um, in the way that that you want us to. Lord, again, thank you, and we praise you for the opportunity we get to be together, and uh, God, just to come and commune with you and each other. Uh, we just ask that this time would be something that honors you and that glorifies you, and in your precious and holy name, amen. 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 Thank you, Harrison. Appreciate that very much. I want to ask those of you who are watching if this is your first time in this revelation study in the last, this is our third week now. If you missed the first two, would you just give us a thumbs up? Would you give us a comment? Say first time. And that way it will help us know where to cue in on some of the things that we've talked about before, because we don't want anyone left behind. Is that right, Jerry? Amen. <laughs> We don't want anyone left behind. So if, you, if this is your first time, if you missed the first couple of weeks, or if there's something in the first couple of weeks from Mark, uh, Greg, any of the people out there that watched that you want us to hit again to come back over, let us know. As I said, you are participants with us in this study. And we're not here just to give a lot of information. We want the interaction. We want to make sure you do understand what is being said. And if you have a question, again, make sure you ask your questions and we will do our best to answer those questions. So tonight, I'm going to ask you a question. It's my turn to ask a question. Do you know that God, the Lord God Jehovah, is a cloud rider? 
the same as someone who might ride a horse? Jerry, have you ever heard that term before? Never. <laughs> I see the puzzled look on your face. How about you, Harrison? <laughs> All not right. once. No, even as a even as a pastor's kid, not once. Oh, yeah. so you're a PK. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. All right. That's awesome. I'm going to keep you in suspense for a little bit, but I want to know, I'm looking for some of the comments in, in the comment section here to see how many of you, if anyone has ever heard the term that the Lord God Jehovah is a cloud writer. We're going to explain that later in the Bible study. But as we talked about in the very beginning, Revelation is the only book that comes with a blessing to those who read it and a blessing to those who hear it. So tonight, I have asked Jerry Blazier to read the entire first chapter of Revelation. And I want you to listen, maybe even sit back and just close your eyes and let the words wash over you. Ask God to reveal, to spark something in you and bring it to the conversation tonight. But this is a time, this is your moment just to sit in the presence of God and receive the blessing of hearing the book, the first chapter of the book of Revelation of Jesus Christ, read to you by Jerry Blazier. Jerry, what version are you reading from before we begin? New King James Version. All right. The, the big letter version. <laughs> Take it away, Jerry. Okay. Uh, I'd like to start off with a little prayer, if you don't mind. Our Lord and precious Heavenly Father, we, we ask you to get us beyond the statistics beyond the facts that are presented here to get to the real meaning behind the facts that are presented in this first chapter as well as the rest of them. Because Lord, sometimes it's easy to get bogged down and try to understand what each one of these candles and, and uh, angels and all of the things that are presented in this first chapter actually represent to more of a deeper meaning that goes beyond just learning facts about uh, the Word of God. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, chapter 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it by these, his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ, and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the word of this prophecy. And keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his father to him he to him be glory and dominion forever and ever amen behold he cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him and they shall also also which pierced him and all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. I, John, who also am, and am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and which thou seest 
write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus and unto Smyrna and unto Pergamos and unto Thyatira, uh, Thyatira unto Sardis and unto Philadelphia and to Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spoke with me and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the son of man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, girth about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hair were white, like wool as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven, sta seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet in, as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, for I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. And the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jerry. So I'm going to ask you, Welcome. what stuck out to you? As you heard this, I see Donna Harper has joined us. What, what jumps out at you as you heard this being read? Now, let me remind you the name of this book and the purpose of this book. It is the revelation of Jesus, the Messiah. Right. This is it, it, a... What? Go ahead, Jerry. Uh, no, I was going to say what sticks out is the reoccurring theme of number seven, which we discussed last week, that how yeah. it is so profound in, in its completeness of each one of these details of the churches and the candlesticks and the stars and, and the one that sits in the middle as a son of man. Yes. Yes, and that one is the one the book is written about. This is Jesus Christ, the Messiah, and he's in the midst of that lampstand, in the midst of the, of the churches. And as you said, we discussed sevens last week. We spent a good bit of time last week discussing those sevens and all of the profound meaning all the way through scripture. We also talked about him saying, I am the first and the last, the Alpha, the Omega. And we took it back to the Hebrew, to the Aleph and the Tav. And as I promised, I posted on Facebook after later in the week that all of this information is available on the GodspeedMinistry.com under the blog. And you can go there to get all of the notes as well as information. So we're trying to put the information up there on godspeedministry.com so that you can have this and use it. Jerry, we're getting some feedback from your phone because you logged in on your phone as well. Yeah, well, I lost, apparently oh, my uh, okay. computer died. Ah, I understand. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm glad you, you're resourceful and able to stay here with us. So that's good. At least it stayed while you got through reading. But I know. we want you to have this information. We want you to know. And we do a lot of research here to make sure that we're giving you a broad reference, not just one individual, because as we have said, as Jerry has said, sometimes there's so much confusion about this book. Um, 
and, and we want you to have clarity as much as we have. Greg Parker says that Deuteronomy 36, 26, there is none like unto the God of Yeshurun who rides upon the heaven in thy help and in his excellency in the sky. So there it I is. Think, there it is. He is talking about the cloud rider. And if you remember, if you have your Bibles with us, and I, I really, really, really encourage you to bring your Bibles to this Bible study. You need to have this on your lap with you or have it on your phone, whichever works. So if you go to Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7, Jerry read this to us. Look, yep. he is coming with clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. When I first did this beginning in January, I ran across a teacher who talked about how the pagan gods would name themselves after the Lord God, Jehovah, the Lord God Almighty. And of course, Jehovah is the Hebrew name for God. Some call him Yahweh, which is a diminutive, uh, that's based off the tetragram, the yud heh vav heh That's about as much Hebrew as I know. But <laughs> I want to share with you the fact that God was the original cloud rider. And as other demons, basically, would try to rise up to the stature of God, they would give names that they wanted to be known by. And of course, it takes a lot of power to ride the clouds. It takes finesse to be able to do this. But let me share with you scripture here that comes from God being a cloud rider. And part of this comes from 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, which we, this is the scripture we know as the rapture scripture. Then we who are alive and remain shall be called up together with them in the clouds because the dead in Christ rise first. So we are caught up with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. But let's go back and spend a little bit of time and talk about why he's called the cloud rider and all of the instances in scripture, like Greg referenced in Deuteronomy 36, 22 of God riding on the clouds, and then let's bring it home. Revelation, we read the Revelation 1, 7, but here's another one in Revelation 14, 14. Then I looked, and behold, anytime you see behold, you need to stop and, and look. You need to get a picture in your mind, a white cloud. And sitting on the cloud was one like a son of man, having a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. And we know from what we know of Bible that this is referencing Jesus Christ. He referred to himself as the son of man more than any other term while he walked this earth. But here's where we're going to make the connection of God meeting us. It's in Leviticus 16.2. The Lord said to Moses, tell your brother Aaron that he shall not enter at any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat, which is on the ark, or he will die. For I will appear in the cloud, in the cloud, over the mercy seat. Let's go on. Deuteronomy 4.11. You came near and stood at the foot of the mountain, and the mountain burned with fire to the very heart of the heavens. Darkness 
cloud and thick gloom. This is when the children of Israel watched Moses go up on the mountain to meet God on Mount Sinai. And the mountain, when God came down from heaven, he came in the clouds on the cloud. So he can be in the cloud or he can be on the cloud. But here the cloud is a symbol of the presence of God. Let me say that again. The cloud is a symbol, a physical manifestation. Maybe not a symbol. Let's go back. It is a physical manifestation of the presence of God. I remember as a child, we were going up to the mountains. My family went to the mountains. I lived near the Appalachians. And we were riding up on a very high peak. I don't know if we were going up on Mount Mitchell, which is the highest peak east of the Mississippi. But as we were going up into the mountain, up the mountain road, the cloud descended. And we could not see where we were going. And I remember my father saying, we're near God. That has always stuck with me. So here we see that God's presence is manifested in the clouds. Another one in number 1642. It came about, however, when the congregation had assembled against Moses and Aaron, that they turned towards the tent of meeting and behold, the cloud covered it and the glory of God appeared. Again, in Exodus 16:10, it came about that Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the sons of Israel. They looked towards the wilderness and behold, the glory of God appeared in the cloud. So why would demonic idols, demons, want to say that their gods were cloud riders? Satan does not do anything original except sin. That's all his. But he is not a creator. He is an imitator. He is a counterfeit. A counterfeit. And any time you saw a cloud, it represented the presence of God. In order to make people think he was powerful, or the deities he created for men to worship as idols on earth, he would give them the titles that would mimic God, counterfeits, because we know that Satan does not have the power. And demons in the early age, when we're talking about getting into these churches, many of their early Words and phrases, descriptions of their false gods included cloud rider. And the, I'm telling you all of this for two purposes. Number one, the book of Revelation that we are studying and that you need to know is so you will be able to discern the truth from the counterfeit. Is that going to be important? I see. Of course, I see. Really. What did you say, Jerry? I walked on you. No, absolutely. Harrison, I saw you shaking your head strongly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We need to know the difference between the real and the fake. We had a policeman come to our church when I was a youth many, many years ago. And he was teaching on drugs, but he also talked about the counterfeit money that was associated with that culture. And one of the youth asked the policeman, how do you know 
what's counterfeit because there's so many counterfeits. And this was his answer. You don't study the counterfeit. You study the real. Amen. So we are studying the real so you will recognize when the counterfeit comes. That's what the book of Revelation is all about. Because there is going to be, be there is going to come a false god, an antichrist that is going to be so cunning, so much like God in his copy of him, that the only way you will know the difference is by knowing the real. Tellers in a bank need to know how to tell a counterfeit bill from a real one. And what they have these tellers do when they first come into the bank is to count the real money all day long. They get a feel for the real. And that's what we need to do here. So let's go on and let's just see some of the verses. We've made the connection We'll come back to that in a moment. But we've made the connection that God's presence is in the clouds. Now, let's go through some more scriptures because I have, we won't go through all of these, but I have two or three pages here in scripture that talks about God riding the clouds. And yet only that scripture by Greg, does anyone, has anyone made any comments about God being a cloud rider and why it's important. Isaiah 19, 1. This is the burden against Egypt. Behold, the Lord rides on a swift cloud. He is coming to Egypt. The idols of Egypt tremble before him and the hearts of the Egyptians melt with fear. It's going to be the same in the book of Revelation. Psalm 68, 4 from David or one of the psalmists there. Sing to God, sing praises to his name. Exalt him who rides on the clouds. His name is the Lord. Isn't that amazing? He rides on the clouds. I think David would have had a lot of practice seeing God ride on the clouds. What do you think, guys? Yep, his presence, he was always seeking his presence. Always think, seeking his presence and to be out in the field with the sh sheep. He probably was one who watched the clouds. Let me come on and, and hold that thought of someone who watches the clouds. Revel uh, we've already read Revelation. Um, I'm trying to see. There's several different scriptures here. I was trying to... to pick out more that talked about him riding on the cloud. But it talks about the cloud. One of these that I want to bring back is, is how Israel was guided. And this comes out of Numbers 9.15. On, on that day that the tabernacle, the tent of testimony, was set up, the cloud covered it. From evening till morning, the cloud above the tabernacle looked like fire. And then we also know that God led the children of Israel by a pillar of fire at night and a pillar of cloud at day. Do you know what the Israelite people were trained and taught to do? They were taught to look for the cloud, to watch the cloud. God wants us to put our focus on him there's a song harrison you probably know it turn your eyes upon jesus you ever sung that one absolutely but it also says that we, we are commanded to fix our eyes upon jesus the author and perfecter of our faith so the children of israel were taught as a new nation that has come out of slavery for nearly 400 years. Do you think they had a mindset to overcome? Being oh. told what to do? 
Go ahead, Jerry. Oh, I'm just saying I can't imagine. Uh, we, we, we minister with inmates, and their day is, is told when to get up, where to go, when to go, how to go, and what to do every day, 24 hours a day. So you can imagine, you have a real life example of what it would be like to be told every move almost you make. You have no freedom in, in that situation. You've, you've lost your freedom because of violation of law in that situation. But these people were taken captive by cruel rulers and made to slave. They, and they had become so indoctrinated. Their children were slaves of slaves of slaves of slaves. There were generations of slavery and there was such a mindset. So when God brings them out and he is trying to teach them about himself, how do you learn about someone? You watch them. You observe them. And they saw how God was this pillar of cloud and day. And they were also in the desert where there was no trees, no shade. And the, I've been in the desert in the southwest of the U.S. And it gets hot even in the wintertime there. So you're hot in the day, but yet at night there's nothing to hold the heat in and it gets so cold. So this is how amazing our God is, is that he gave them a pillar of cloud to watch, but that cloud also extended over and provided them shade to keep them from burning, to keep their water and their skin from parching, from their water evaporating. And then at night, when the sun has set, he has a pillar of fire to warm an entire nation of millions of people with all of their herds and livestock. And God is teaching them to watch him. Now, Harrison, you or Jerry or anybody out there on Facebook, have you ever watched the clouds? Definitely, yeah. Yep, absolutely. Why do you watch clouds? I think it's interesting. I think it's cool to see God's creation in such a different way. You know, it's so different from all the things that we kind of tend to overlook sometimes, like flowers and trees and everything around us. And, and the clouds, I think, are especially fascinating. Jerry? Well, my thought was is that, you know, you, you see the clouds from Earth, but yet when you're in an airplane, you can pass through them as if they, they exist, but they don't exist. Because yeah. if they existed, they would be a solid object and you don't fly through solid objects. But in an aircraft, you, you can pass right through the clouds. So the cloud, that's a great illustration of spiritual. Because we can see, remember after Jesus was resurrected, he had a physical body that you could see and you could touch, but yet he passed through walls. So that's a great example of that. I remember as a little girl, if I had friends over, I had three younger brothers, and sometimes I would lay in the grass and would lay up and look at the trees, but it was mostly my uh, young and, and I say young because they were only 8, 10, 12 years older than me. So as a little girl, four or five years old, and living on a farm with, where you had no toys or anything, it was only work. We made our own recreation. And one of our favorite pastimes was to look up at the clouds and try to see what you could see in the cloud. Did you ever look for the animals or different shapes in the cloud. Yep. I'm trying to see if any of our Facebook families out there adding in any comments to it. So when we are laying and gazing at the clouds, we are doing it because of what God taught the Israelite people to do. It becomes instinctive in us 
doesn't it? Like you were saying, Harrison, it just is a different form of creation that is constantly moving and, and developing new faces and new shapes. And that is a picture of our God. His creativity knows no limits. And yet he is revealing himself to us in the clouds. And when I began this study and I saw this, as well as the thought, the concept that God's manifest presence is in those clouds, I vowed to never look at a cloud the same way again. To know, just to have that concept that when I see a cloud in the sky, God is saying, I'm here, I'm here. Stop and communicate with me. How powerful is that? I hope you're blessed by that. I hope it gives you a new idea and a new concept that God has put that in us. Okay, so now let's get back into Revelation. We took that little detour because I want you to be blessed. I want you to see the depth of Scripture of what God is doing. So last week, as we talked about, we've gone over the sevens. We've gone over the first and the last. And we're going to pick up now in Revelation chapter 1, verse 9, and this is John. Have we talked about yet why John of all the apostles, disciples of Jesus, why would he choose John? Have we talked about that at all? Or do you have an idea of why John might have been the one selected to receive this revelation, this new revelation of Jesus Christ? Any thoughts, guys? One, he was the last one alive. Okay. And two, Last he was beloved of Christ and loved of John and John of him. All right. You're, you hit it right there, Jerry. John was the beloved disciple. In fact, in, in John's uh, letter, in the Gospel of John, John always refers to himself as the one whom Christ loved. Think about that. I I just don't know that I could refer to myself that way to the world. But he was so solid in it. He was one of the trio, the three inner circle of Jesus Christ. It was John, Peter, and James. These were the three that were allowed to go up to the Mount of Transfiguration. These were the three that were taken a little further than the other nine when Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane the night before he was betrayed. Of course, Judas was, had left. But John was in the inner circle. If anyone, anyone knew Jesus, do you think it might be John? Yep. He probably knew the heart of Jesus better than anyone else. And John is given this new revelation. He's seeing Jesus as he never saw him on earth. He's seeing him as the king of kings. He's going to see him as the judge of all the earth. So John is also telling these churches, he's writing to these seven churches at the command of God the Father, And he's writing to them and he says, I am your brother and companion in the persecution. John was being persecuted. And we're going to see as we get into the churches in the next few weeks, there was some horrendous persecution going on in these early churches. He says, I'm your brother and companion in the persecution as well as the kingdom. John's done amazing things through the name and the power of Jesus, as well as the patience. It takes patience when you're going through persecution. And he was on the Isle that's called Patmos on account of the word of God. He has been exiled 
because he would not stop preaching the word that Jesus Christ was the Messiah, the son of the living God, and that because of his birth, life, death, burial, and resurrection, it's a five step, birth, life, crucifixion, or death, the burial, and the resurrection, that now we get to come into this kingdom not just as members of a church, but we are given the power, and he's going to show us that here in a few minutes. And he says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. So he's having a vision, or is it a, an outer body, or was his body taken up? Several times in scripture, we don't know exactly. We're not sure, and even John is not sure, I don't think. When all of a sudden behind me, he says, a great voice, a voice like a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Jerry, when you were reading this, did it show it in red? Yes. Yes. So these are the words of Jesus, just like in the Gospels. And in fact, his name's going to fly right out, Michael Rood who is in Concord, North Carolina, about 50 miles from me, he says this is the fifth gospel. The book of Revelation is the fifth gospel because the words of Jesus are in red. So he tells John what you see right in the book and send it to the seven assemblies. Now this is where the word ecclesia comes in. And if you remember when we were talking about preparing for the king, we talked about this ecclesia being a called out, ruling, reigning body. And I'll put those notes on the website this week. You'll be able to find the notes on the cloud writer as well as the ecclesia in the notes this week. So he says, these are assemblies. These are the called out, ruling, reigning body of God. We call it a church. But I think we don't rule and reign very much in our churches these days, do we, Jerry or Harrison? What about you guys out there on Facebook? No. Nope. We've lost <laughs> our purpose in God and his kingdom. We're supposed to be undoing the work of Satan. We're supposed to be demonstrating Jesus Christ. In fact, let me see if I can find this right. Whoops. I, I ran across this today as I was doing some work, and I don't know if I can find it quickly, but there is, I have a note that is saved on my phone. Here it is. And it says, my message and preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. So that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. 1 Corinthians 2.4. These disciples lived that. They didn't preach with words of, of cunning and smartness. They preached with a demonstration of the power of God. And he's writing to these churches that are enduring the same type of persecution that John has endured. So send it to these seven churches and he turns to see, remember the voices behind him. So he turns to see who spoke with him. And when he turned, he saw the seven golden lampstands. Let me share this. I, I'm gonna share my screen with you here. See if I can get this up. So again, we talked about this one last week. This is a sevenfold spirit of God. But let me show you this one. That here you see him with the seven golden lampstands. And Jesus standing there. So this is John's description of him. In the midst of the seven golden candlesticks was one like a son of man. Again, the title that Jesus described himself with. He was clothed with a garment down to the feet. 
He had a golden sash wrapped around his chest, and you can see that behind those stars in this picture. The hair on his head was white as wool. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and his feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many, many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth, let me see if I can move this right here so you can see it better. Put this over here on this side. And out of his mouth, a sharp sword. Can you imagine seeing someone like this as you're just praying and worshiping on the Lord's day? His appearance was like the sun shining brightly. What happens when you look at the sun, guys? You're, <laughs> exactly, Harrison, exactly. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. And then he laid his right hand on me and he says, do not be afraid. Isn't that our Lord? He always wants to calm us and reassure us. He says, don't be afraid. He doesn't want us to fear him. He says, I am the last, the first and the last. We went through that, as you said last week, Jerry, with the olive and the toff. He says, I am the one who lives, though I was dead. He leaves no doubt to John. John was the only disciple to go to the cross. Judas had betrayed him and was nowhere, but the other ten who were left did not go to the cross. They did not watch their Savior die. John did. He was there with Mary, the mother of Jesus. And Jesus even said, son, behold your mother and mother, behold your son. He entrusted his mother to this beloved disciple, even though Mary had other sons and daughters. We know that James, who wrote the book of James in the gospel, as well as Judas, were both half-brothers of Jesus. But yet, John is the one who showed up, who went to the cross, but not on the cross with Jesus. And he says, I am the one who lives, though I was dead. And then he makes the statement, I am alive forevermore. <laughs> Can you just imagine? I mean, John had seen him after he rose from the dead. He walked with him back and forth those 40 days. And he was there when he was taken up into heaven. And now he is reassuring John and all of us, I am alive forevermore. Hallelujah. That's almost like an Easter. Woo! Yes. <laughs> And he says, I have the keys of Hades and of death. He took those keys back when he was buried and descended into hell. And now he gives him this charge. He has reassured John that I am who you think I am. I, I do have all authority. Remember, he told his disciples before he ascended, all power. If he has all power, how much power does the devil have? Ah, goose None. egg. <laughs> and I think we need to be reminded of that. I think that's one of the reasons that it's good to be on this study tonight. So now he says, write the things which you have seen. What are some things that John has seen, guys? John wrote it's... the book, the gospel, his gospel. He wrote the things he has seen. He's writing the things he's seen right here. He's describing Jesus. He's describing where he was and what was going on. And then he says, write the things which are. So as we get into the churches, he's going to write the situation that these seven assemblies, these seven congregations, these seven ecclesias 
is how the Greek word was named as a ruling governing body for the kingdom of God. We're going to see the situation they are in. And it is going to inspire you to see what these people were willing to do to, to proclaim the gospel in a very pagan, hostile world. And then he says, and the things which will take place after this. And that's how Revelation is broken up. The things which were, the things which are, and the things which will be. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my hand. Let me go back and share that screen one more time with you guys, just so you have a picture of it. So the mystery of the seven stars you see in my right hand, and the right hand was always the hand of power. It was always the hand of authority. So the mystery of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks, here's the answer. The seven stars are the angels of the seven assemblies, the seven churches. Now, let me stop right there. The word angel means a messenger. It means someone who delivers a message from God. I used to take issue with people who called other human beings angels because in my concept, an angel was only a spiritual being. But here, these seven angels are messengers. They are the pastors of the local assemblies of these seven local churches. And you will see that as we go through. So these angels are actually human beings. They are the pastors, the messengers to these seven churches. And you're going to see that too, because he is going to tell John, write this to the angel, to the pastor of this local congregation. So the word will come from God to John and the letter will be written to the pastor and then it will be the pastor's responsibility to share the message from God with his local congregation. Well, we see that in today's church, don't we guys? Yep. It is it's exactly the same, exactly the same. So here we have the seven stars are the seven angels, the messengers to the seven assemblies and the seven candlesticks, which you see or saw are the seven assemblies. All right, let's go back to this image one more time because I want you to get this in your head securely. The stars, what are they guys? Help us out here. You guys out there on Facebook too. What are the stars? They're the angels, the teachers, the pastors. Right. And what are the seven candlesticks? Churches to which he's to pastor. That's it. So you see how simple the book of Revelation is going to break down. Scripture will reveal and answer scripture. So I want to make sure that you have that. And of course, the sword, what do we know? The sword of God is the word, the word, the word. So we see right here. So Jesus is speaking the word. He holds the seven pastors in his right hand. I got to change hands here. And the lampstands, the candlesticks are the assemblies. Did Jesus not tell his disciples in, excuse me, in Matthew? that you are the light of the world. And now we see it being fulfilled. We're seeing revelation as the fulfillment of all scripture. All scripture will be fulfilled in this book when it happens. So there we have it. So these next two chapters 
are going to be the seven letters dictated by Jesus Christ directly to John, who will write them down and then send them to the pastors, to the leaders, to the angels of these seven churches. And that's where we, are, we will be going in the next few weeks. But I want you to know that you have been blessed tonight, not because of what I have been saying. I hope you have been blessed by that, but because you have heard the word of God. And it is my heart's desire that you know more than you did coming in. Key takeaways. I, I'm not getting many comments out there. Harrison, you have any that not showing up on mine or is our group no. quiet tonight? We're quiet. I think everybody's just listening in awe. <laughs> <laughs> the word of God is amazing. It, I love it so, so, so much. It's just this book has taught me so much. And I want to share that excitement and knowledge with you. And I thank you guys. What's one of your key takeaways tonight or something that you found interesting? Mine was when you described the, the uh, pillar of fire that was over them. Did anybody else see that pillar besides the Jewish people? Hmm. I don't know, Jerry. That's a good question. Was it a light to, to direct? others which is usually what god's always trying to do and did anybody else see it you can't hardly hide we, we know we can't have a light so how far did that light shine into the darkness well jerry i don't know the answer but i do know that when the Egypt, when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, they brought with them numerous converts to the kingdom of God. And always they were bringing new people into the kingdom from the nations that they would travel by or through. They were always expanding the kingdom of God. And that's something that a lot of people don't teach or may not know so good question jerry good question yes god's god's light is for everyone who will come to it anything else i don't see just, any more comments i found it just especially interesting just with honestly you know deciphering it, it may sound simple but just decoding that passage there with the the lampstands and the stars and you know, it's like that stuff for, and especially for a new believer can be really, really tough to I imagine reading that for the first time in the Bible, you know, and you have no Christian influence in your life and you're like, what the heck is going on? You know, so I think that was really, really good and, and insightful and very helpful to those that are really reaching for Christ. So. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, Harrison. All right. Well, I hope that you guys have been blessed. I'd love to read your comments. You can leave them. And again, we want you to go to our central hub, godspeedministry.com. We'll have the definition of the ecclesia there. We will have the scripture about the cloud rider. And if there's other information that you want, you can reach out to us. You can message us here on Facebook or YouTube. Leave us a comment. We'll get back to you. And always, we want you to go to our central hub where we are going to keep putting our notes and our information out there as much as possible. We're here for you. I mean, it takes a lot of work and time out of our lives to do this, but it's because we're called to share with you the knowledge and saving grace of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And, and one of the scriptures that drives my life comes out of Hosea, that my people, God speaking, saying that my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. And as we talked about with the counterfeit and the cloud writers and all of the things you need to know, 
And so I'm going to give you, Jerry and Harrison are going to share their information and their insights because you need to know. That's why we're here. We love you guys. I'm going to ask Jerry to close us in prayer tonight. Jerry? Absolutely. Our Lord and precious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word that it washes us, that it uh, surrounds us, and it uh, fills us with the coming knowledge that uh, life is more than what we live. It's, it's, it's about where we're going, that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and that, that it is real. It's not a, it's not a phantom. It's not a, it's not a good story. It's not a fairy tale, but it is the truth that we are all looking forward to, that one day that we will, we will stand with you, and, and, uh, and hopefully we will hear the words that thou good and faithful servant, enter into your rest, for you have served me well. Lord, that is our wish, that is your command, and that is our pleasure. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I want to thank Harrison. I want to thank Jerry. And I thank you for joining us tonight. And we hope that you will visit us at GodspeedMinistry.com. It is with a Y, not ministries, but ministry, singular, because our ministry is to God and then to you. We thank you for being here with us tonight. And remember, you can be a witness and sharing this on your Facebook page, sharing it directly with friends or telling others about it. Because the more people who hear about our God, the better our world. And you will be fulfilling the great commission of Jesus Christ. So I thank again each and every one of you. We hope to see you next week right here on Tuesday night with the Godspeed Ministry Bible Study. Godspeed.